Now, electric vehicles. I'm joined by James Court, head of the Electric Vehicle Association. As I said a moment ago, James, uh, you know, part the Parliamentary Committee is so worried about CO2 emissions, so worried, even though we are, you know, less than 1% of global CO2 emissions, they're so worried about it, they're saying, actually, after 2030, even hybrids shouldn't be made. So let's discuss the case for and against yep. electric vehicles. The timeline of 2030, after which no new cars or vans will get manufactured unless they're all electric, I mean, it's for the birds, isn't it? I really don't think it is. I mean, you look at where we are and look at where we've come from. Pre-2019, we had a dozen electric vehicles and choice. Now we've got over 150. There's models and shapes and sizes to all manner of things. Uh, 2030 is still a long way away. And I think people forget that we're not trying to ban all electric vehicles and that it is just new cars. There's still probably going to be between 20 and 30 percent of electric vehicles on the road by 2030. Well, you That's say that. Really... So if we look at the number of electric vehicles on the road now, yeah. how many would it be? Two percent. So, you know, a small number. And you think by 2030 it could be 70 percent? The trajections that the ZEV mandate, which is the policy mechanism that's going to get us there to 2030, 35, the trajectory they've taken is pretty much what the car industry was saying was going to be business as normal, it was business as usual. So we're looking at the growth and where we've come from, we look at the demand, and we're looking at what the motor industry themselves say they can manufacture. A lot of people on the green side were actually wanting much quicker transition well, over. So well, this is already I, an I wonder industry. about this. I wonder about this. I mean, here we've got the Greenies, who don't want us to produce our own oil and our own gas and our own coal, even though we're going to need this stuff for decades. There's no question in some way we will need this stuff for decades. But they're more than happy. You know, let's not have a small anthracite mine in Cumbria, but they're more than happy in the case of lithium, major problem, most of the big lithium reserves now around the world are controlled by China. Cobalt, we know, uh, you know, appalling conditions in, in Central Africa. I mean, we are going to need, if your targets are going to get met, we're going to need to start mining around the world on a scale never seen before by humanity. How green is that? I mean, we've seen huge changes happen in a very short amount of time. We saw a shift from town gas to natural gas. Mm -hmm. uh, that was every home in the country got done in um, under 10 years. But that's technology, right? Yeah. And I get that. That was a shift in technology and a very significant and a very good one uh, in many, many ways. What I'm saying to you is there will be open-cast lithium mining across the world at a massive scale. And why do, not, why do people not think that actually... The amount of CO2 we're going to need, need to produce these cars and to get these minerals, let alone the price, because already electric cars are quite a lot more expensive. I mean, I would have thought that if your timelines were met, I can't even imagine what the price of copper, cobalt and lithium is going to be by 2030. So there's a lot to unpack there. I I'm think sorry, there is. But... There is. There's a few things. I mean, on, on, on the, the lithium side of it, hmm. I think it's important that manufacturers, and actually on the battery side, the vast majority of large battery manufacturers now have signed up to uh, pledges on lithium and cobalt, and I think that's necessary and needed. Um, but we, we're already we, beginning we, to see... When you say pledges, what do you mean? In the same way that you have fair fuel coffee, they will be trying to make sure that their supply chain is as clean as it possibly can be. And that's a pledge that not a lot of other uh, oil and gas companies and petrol companies have taken. I think we've got to look at sort of both the lithium and the need for lithium. It's in everything we've got. I'm sure you've got lithium on you right now. And I think actually the amount of lithium that goes into the batteries isn't as great as everybody thinks. And we're already seeing technology advances. Already this year, there's going to be a sodium battery put into a car, and that's already on sale, and hopefully will be on sale in the UK later. Technology advances on this is going to be huge. Either way, this will have to be a mining revolution around the world that will be needed if countries like us are going to go towards EVs. I, I, on that... All I can say is that I listen uh, to people like Elon Musk who say that, OK, in the next year or two, there are squeaks, uh, there are pinches on lithium. But the long term of it, this is a reasonably abundant well, resource and there are already technological Elon Musk, advances. Elon advances. Musk does have, you know, actually to sort of have to talk his book a little bit. I mean, let's be fair about this. Now, the cars are incredibly heavy. They're making potholes in Britain much worse than they already could be. They're endangering all sorts of multi-storey car parks where it may be impossible 
for these cars to go. There are no charging points. And when you get to a charging point, the rip-off prices, are particularly on the motorways, are horrific. All right. Give me one at a time. We'll try and work their way through. <laughs> we haven't got long. So we haven't got long. <laughs> uh, on the pothole issue, I mean, the most significant thing there would be freight. And I think when you're talking about the, the, extra, the extra weight of cars, all right, model, for, model all right, for model, it's I, like 15%. I tell, you what, I tell you what, I'll give you that on the potholes. All right, fine. But these are incredibly heavy. 15% more, questions. roughly, yep. than, uh, than the model. So yep. a, a Golf versus an e-Golf, you're talking around 15% more uh, heavier. The real problem is that also cars have just got huge. I mean, I wasn't around in the 1970s, but when you were designing car parking spaces, when you're designing sort of car parks, we were driving much smaller cars. That is a much bigger... And much lighter cars. And much lighter cars. Much, much lighter oh, cars. Oh, completely. Yeah. So, I mean, just people's tastes in cars have moved much more to much larger cars. It is definitely a problem. We're all driving too bigger cars. Now, chap that drives me around quite a lot. Yep. Spent quite a lot of money on a brand new London black taxi. It's electric, but in reality... In reality, he has to run it on petrol for most of the time. It's just not working. The charging points in London, the infrastructure simply isn't there. The cost of that infrastructure going in would be enormous. I mean, let's face it, this just at the moment, and I grant you 2030s a few years away, at the moment, this just is not a practical proposition, is it? See, I think the, I think the black cabs is a real success story for the UK. We sort of obviously it's a very iconic vehicle, mm -hmm. and within three or four years, they've managed to completely turn around their supply chain and produce this first of a kind sort of electric uh, black cab. They will only get better as well. And I think the thing that, and you probably well, they're going to need to. You travel in cab, need to. You travel in black cabs probably more than I do. But when I speak to them, especially when we're charging, I see sort of a black cab driver. The thing they say isn't, and it's something that isn't really mentioned, is just how nicer they are to drive and how quieter they are. Now, that's something that you say after the end of the work. You haven't got that ringing headache because you haven't been juddering around for the last 12 well, hours. Well, I... It's but, we don't but, talk but, about. The drive quality is great. But, but the point, you see, the whole point of our debate here... Yeah. ..tonight, and we obviously want our audience to hear both sides of every argument. We're GB News, we try and put it all out there, and we say to people at home they're big enough and ugly enough yep. to make their own minds up on things. But the point I'm making is that this is where theory, you know, does tend to collide with practice. The theory of these electric cabs, and they're beautifully made, and, as you say, they're quiet when they run and all the rest of it, but the theory hits the practice, and in practice, most electric cabs are driving around on petrol. And this is very interesting. When it comes to range, range of electric cars and London taxis, I just feel the electric manufacturers just lie to us the whole time. The fact is, the ranges are not great. So I've got a very... I would say I've got a Kia Nero, which is sort of a mid-range market car, I get it on a salary sacrifice. Um, I would be honest and say that it does 200... It's advertised, I think, 250, 260. It does 220 in mm. winter. It does 300 in the summer. And if I'm driving on a motorway, and especially if I'm doing uh, marginally over 70 miles an hour, then that does obviously uh, reduce the battery a little bit more. But it's the same with ICE cars. I mean, ICE cars are also less reliable, ICE being obviously petrol and diesel yeah. cars. Uh, they are less reliable, uh, less um, efficient in winter and also less efficient when driving on motorways. It's something, and I think this is when your viewers do get into them. I mean, I think I've over-batteried. My car has said about 260 miles on average. I actually think for what I do now, I could save myself 10 grand and go down to 120, 150 mile range because that would suit my purpose. That would suit your purpose. Wouldn't suit and mine. I wouldn't, no, and no. this is it. And I think the thing is right now, again, let's remember that we are talking about a very small number in the next seven years. I'm lucky I live in uh, London and I've got lamppost charges on my mm. street. 70% of people in the UK have no. driveways, and that's when you can really start... Yeah, saving if, you're living in, if you're living in a tower block, it's impossible. It's, gonna, that's, it's definitely going to be more of a All challenge. Right. Well, James, we'll debate this again. Please. Thank you for coming in.